Everyone gets everything he wants. I wanted a mission, and for my sins, they gave me one. Brought it up to me like room service. Brian Danielson is not that far removed from his lengthy and epic ROH title run that saw him retain his title against all comers, until finally he was defeated by Homicide, who may or may not become very important in this tale. Always a fan favorite, Danielson's title reign codified him as the best wrestler in the world, a moniker he embraced as he became more and more of a cocky heel over the course of his run. His bullying of Nigel McGuinness in particular, proclaiming himself better than the Beatles while in Liverpool, cemented him as the unbeatable final boss of the ROH roster, a wrestling god not unlike Yahweh in the story of the Tower of Babel, cruelly punishing any challenger to his throne for the insolent naivety that they could ever challenge his dominance. If you've somehow come to this video without subscribing to Joseph Monticilio, please do so. He has a series on Danielson vs. McGinnis that greatly informs the bulk of this presentation. This American Dragon is no longer a man of flesh and blood. He's a machine that chews up the hopes and dreams of his opposition and spits them out. However, since that reign, something has suddenly shifted in his character. His confident, smug demeanor has changed very little, but the way the fans react to him has. Simply put, he's gone from a cocky prick that the fans love to hate, to a cocky prick that the fans love to love. No longer the champ, he doesn't stand in the way of fan favorites' aspirations towards glory in the same way, and the goodwill he's fostered with the crowds by simply being the best has led him to becoming something of a hero to the unwashed masses. With the people behind him more than ever, he has one mission to codify his status as the best in the world. Reclaim the ROH world title. This other man, Takeshi Morishima, has now come into possession of what ought to belong to him. And Dragon's coming for what's his. On excursion to Ring of Honor from his homeland of pro wrestling Noah, within the context of a squared circle, Takeshi Morishima is less a man and more like Behemoth, created by Mitsuharu Misawa and Akira Tawe to possess peerless power and dominance. Despite losing to Samoa Joe early in his ROH tenure, the very next day in the ever sunny city of Philadelphia, he crushed Homicide to claim the world championship. It wasn't necessarily a shock because of who or what he was. After all, so many people who worked for or booked ROH at the time were fans of his teachers, those who walked the King's Road. More so, it was a shock because the crowd barely knew him as a newcomer to the company. Since winning the belt, he's gone on a rampage, befitting a 300-pound brawler powered by protein and bad haircut decisions, slaying company stalwarts such as McGinnis, Castagnoli, and the late great Jay Briscoe. His presentation is dominant and unique for the company, and thus he's a special attraction to the crowd who's grown to appreciate his monstrous presence and mastery of the backdrop driver. Most importantly for this tale, much like the biblical behemoth is prophesized to lock horns with the sea dragon Leviathan, Morishima is fated to have his most important matches in the West against an American dragon. His equal and opposite in many ways.
All this context brings us to Manhattan Mayhem 2, where Brian Danielson challenges for his lost title against the surging champ. This match is so transcendent that it's special before the bell even rings, with the exuberant dragon full of emotion contrasted against the stoic monster across the ring from him. Dragon begins methodically, as he does in many of his world-renowned indie epics, looking to surgically pick apart Morishima's leg with Muay Thai-style kicks to the thigh. Danielson blitzing in to attack the legs of Takeshi before darting out may look slightly silly to some viewers. It's for sure a little playful from Danielson, but any practitioner of MMA or Muay Thai hi Sam, will test to you that those kicks to the meat of your legs hurt and in a shoot context, will absolutely shred your motivation to stay mobile in a fight. This stick and poke strategy initially works well for Dragon, spurred on by you are going to get your fucking head kicked in chance, but eventually Morishima catches the pesky gnat in the corner, punishing him with punches that look absolutely sickening. I couldn't verify this with 100% certainty, but this is assuredly the moment in which Danielson's retina becomes shoot detached by Morishima. Throughout the match, commentary will note the damaged eye of Danielson, so I'm not certain whether there was a plan beforehand to work the eye and things got a little too real, or there was some amazing communication between Danielson and the staff regarding his eye. Regardless, it's an impressive feat to continue at such a high level with his eyeball tissue mutilated and from this point, Danielson is all fire resiliently coming back from every bit of Morishima's offense, even releasing a primal scream of fury after a springboard crossbody. It may just be David and Goliath, but done with such a sincere sense of urgency and violence by both men, it becomes a near-perfect masterpiece, with Danielson's real injury adding grit and realness to the aura of the match. Despite a series of extended submission sequences by Danielson, it's ultimately not enough. Morishima reverses a back superplex attempt by simply falling forward onto Danielson in a spot reminiscent of similar ones from the heyday of All Japan. Finally, Morishima nails a lariat, followed by a backdrop driver for the three count, ending Dragon's underdog attempt to win back his title. This is an amazing match, but not nearly perfect as some weird pacing in the first half, likely stemming from the very real injury, holds it back the tiniest bit. Regardless, a hot crowd and almost flawless set of performances result in an epic told in just 20 minutes. I'm going with Uncle Dave on this one and giving it 4.75 stars. Nearly perfect. Don't worry, there will be a perfect score handed out somewhere in this saga. This match is free on Ring of Honor's YouTube channel, so you have no excuse not to watch it. It's a month later, and Dragon is beginning to change from a sleeping monster content to lay on his piles of battle-earned gold to a predator on the hunt for his prey. In the first match, Morishima took his eye, albeit temporarily he got better, but now Danielson will repay him by taking his soul. In the first outing, Danielson was comfortable. Yes, he's lost before in ROH, but there's never really been a challenge that overwhelmed him the same way that Morishima did in the first match. In an amazing promo before the match, Dragon wears an eye patch following his retina being detached and orbital bone damaged. He says that he contemplated retirement, but he needs to try this again after the devastating loss three weeks ago. There's no honor to begin this match, as the pre-match handshake in accordance with the Code of Honor is not observed. Danielson begins the match much more recklessly than before, blitzing Morishima with vicious forearms. Morishima stated before the match he will not exploit the damaged eye of Dragon, and yet upon catching Danielson with a boot, he sends him into the guardrail, destroying his eye patch. They trade moves back and forth for a while, Danielson using his body as a weapon by flinging himself into suicide dives and flying knees, and Morishima powerbombing him, which earns a two count. Danielson then counters with a brilliant submission sequence, transitioning from a triangle choke to a Mexican surfboard to a bow and arrow choke. He smothers Morishima, reminding the ref he has until five once the Goliath grabs the ropes for a break. Unfortunately for Dragon, Morishima is indeed a monster and so Takeshi sends him to the Shadow Realm with a forearm. 
This pattern of crafty work by Dragon with sneaky schoolboy attempts and submission attempts continues, but time and time again, they're countered by the brute force of Morishima. Finally, Danielson goes for a superplex like he did in the first match, but this time gets it, bridging into a pin and then a cattle mutilation that makes the crowd come unhinged. Morishima, however, comes back, nailing Dragon with a backdrop driver, but he gets his foot on the ropes to break the count. This pisses Morishima off. And from this point, it's a battle for survival. Morishima betrays his honor and rips off the remaining bandage, hitting another backdrop driver before finishing Dragon on the mat with ground and pound straight to the fucking eye instead of going for the pin. The referee is forced to step in, and Dragon yet again loses, except this time due to Morishima being dishonorable. These losses are beginning to consume him, and sooner or later his heart will be completely filled with darkness of revenge. Twice now, Morishima has denied him what's rightfully his. Morishima is going to pay, even if Dragon doesn't get the title back. He's going to hell, and Morishima is coming with him. Four and a half stars. It's two months later, and Morishima somehow lost the title to Nigel McGuinness. Dragon's title. The title he nearly lost a fucking eye trying to reclaim. Yet at this point, it's meaningless. Dragon is going to make an example of Morishima to show what happens when you defy the best wrestler in the world. Morishima is still making his entrance when Danielson jumps him, something you should keep in your memory for later. He absolutely batters Takeshi against the barricade again and again even pushing the cameraman aside at one point to continue the onslaught. He eventually tries to take to the air, but is countered by Morishima into a Saito suplex and then curb stomps which are booed heavily, going on to target the eye yet again. They trade their previous strategies in the crowd, Danielson using sleepers and clotheslines, and Morishima stiff clubs and boots. Finally, however, the match gets messy. Looking to satiate his bloodlust, Dragon grabs the ring hammer and stabs Morishima in the fucking eye. However, in his mania, Dragon fails to stop Morishima from countering, who hits a crazy backdrop driver onto the floor. Danielson limply makes it to the apron, but is tortured by Morishima, who repeatedly hits running strikes to the wounded animal. Danielson is now covered in delicious blood while he tries to make a comeback. Morishima tries to halt his progress with a lariat and then backdrop driver, but Danielson flips out. They trade MMA-style offense until Morishima targets the eye yet again. It's then Dragon reaches the point of no return in this tale. Pissed the fuck off and frustrated by all the damage he's taken, Dragon reminds Morishima what the capital of Thailand is. Bangkok! Taking him to Dick Kick City with about 10 curb stomps until the ref finally calls for a DQ. With this decision, this feud is no longer anything resembling a sporting competition. It's kill or be killed. In a promo backstage after the match, Dragon says that because Morishima took one of his eyeballs, he took one of Morishima's testicle balls. Always great to see him still being a dork in the face of cold blood and murder. Dragon may have begun the feud on the moral upswing, but by the end there will be no heroes. Only survival. Four stars. Seeing as the previous match ended in a DQ, the following match, the shortest in the series, is contested under what's known as relaxed rules. Once again, this match begins in the aisle, Dragon throwing off his rope to signal he's ready to brawl. Even though the fighting has become vicious and personal, there's a strange understanding that's been formed between these two men for the remainder of the feud. Gone is any pretense that this is about sports, titles, or honor. It's a primal struggle between two men, an honest depiction of violence in pursuit of destruction. They're no longer battling to win, they're shooting to kill. Eye gouges and guardrail slams ensue, 
and the bell doesn't even ring for about two minutes after the brawl starts. Finally, a missile dropkick from Morishima, pushing Dragon into the ring, actually officially starts the match. Takeshi then goes vintage territory era four and heel, choking Dragon with the ropes, raking his back, and finally forcing the injured eye into the ropes in an act of precise cruelty, uncharacteristic of the normally blunt force monster. Danielson attempts to force a comeback with a leg lariat followed by leg kicks that call back to the first match, but is squashed by a powerbomb, lariat, and backdrop driver. Morishima attempts to return the favor from last time and throws ground and pound on Dragon, who pulls off a jiu-jitsu sweep to assume mount and turn the tables. But Morishima escapes, and frustrated by the audacity of this pale little goat child refusing to die, reciprocates penile destruction with a low blow followed by curb stomps to the penis. He even beats up the ref when he tries to stop him, and chaos ensues with refs trying to restrain Morishima. In the midst of the chaos, Dragon grabs the ring bell and the hammer, thus causing a DQ on a technicality because they can't record a pinfall or submission with them. Dragon stabs Morishima in the eye, screaming that he is going to blind this son of a bitch as the refs pull him off. This match is the shortest and least good from an in-ring standpoint, but what I love is that all these matches feel distinctly different. They don't really try to recapture or top any of the previous matches in a way that would feel forced, and they create an experience of two men deteriorating mentally, physically, and morally as they attempt to destroy each other. Three and a half stars on the sincere violence alone. Now comes the strange and slightly botched on ROH's part of the feud. Dragon and Morishima both take part in a four-way elimination match to become number one contender for the ROH world title alongside the crippling waste of talent Austin Aries and the ever-excellent Chris Hero. To slay the monster, initially all of the other three men team up to beat down and eliminate Morishima, with Dragon getting some measure of revenge by denying Morishima the chance to get back into the title scene. I won't cover the match in detail, but Danielson does go on to win the match before losing his title match against Nigel fucking McGinnis in February of 2008. Throughout the rest of the year, Dragon chases the title, while Morishima goes on to win glory in Noah by unseating Mitsuharu Misawa as the GHC heavyweight champion and beating a who's who of the promotion until dropping it to the stud himself, Kensuke Sasaki, in September. When Takeshi Morishima won the GHC title for Mitsuharu Misawa on March 2nd, 2008, it was definitely seen as a big step in the right direction for Noah. Misawa, in his last reign, was very much broken down and only really held onto the belt for so long because of his popularity, and Kenta Kabashi hadn't long made his return from his successful cancer treatment. With Morishima having such success overseas in Win of Honor, people hoped he'd have a lengthy run with the GHC title, but it just wasn't to be. In the end, he'd only make two successful defences of the belt, one against Takashi Segura, an ex-junior wrestler who was very much on the rise, but still about 18 months away from his peak, and the other against Takeshi Rikio, his former tag team partner and ex-GHC champion, who was on the way down due to various injuries that had left him not far away from retirement. Neither of these were particularly major defences, the match against Rikio in particular did not perform well inside the Budokan with an audience of less than 10,000, and when it came time for his first truly significant title defence on the 6th of September against Kensuke Sasaki, he fought hard but he would ultimately lose the title. As for reasons why Morishima's GHC reign ended up missing the mark, like various others such as Naomichi Marufuji's and Junakiyama's had before it, while it's possible to speculate that a failed WWE tryout while he was still GHC champion, one fully agreed to by Noah as part of a deal that the WWE was never truly going to go for, was part of the reason for his reign ending quite suddenly due to Noah being unhappy with his level of performance, the likelier truth was far bigger than Morishima's performances on the card as champion. 
As the credit crunch and global recession bit hard in the summer of 2008, Noah found themselves in a very precarious position financially, as did their main carrier, Nippon TV, who ran a weekly show for Noah, albeit in the dead of night. In this time of financial crisis, Kensuke Sasaki, an established big star and long-time freelancer, made a deal to make Noah his home promotion, and the strap went his way in order to try and patch up the wounds, if you will. And it probably should be noted that even Sasaki's arrival and reign wasn't enough to stop Noah from losing their weekly TV show in 2009. Morishima's first GHC title reign was unfortunate and his other ones weren't ever going to be as significant, but while it's certainly a shame he didn't get to do more major matches as champion, the reasons for his reign sputtering out were, in the end, largely out of his control. He made a few one-off appearances in Ring of Honor throughout the year, but the final ROH pay-per-view of 2008 would mark his last ever appearance in the company. That December, at Final Battle, one last match was made after almost exactly a year of them not facing each other. Brian Danielson versus Takeshi Morishima in a fight without honor. Then I went and visited my dad, and uh, you know, my dad's a great guy. He's got a lot of wisdom, and I respect his opinion and all that kind of stuff. We were talking about all the different options and stuff that I have. You know, I could go back to school, I could go work in the mill, and uh, but right before my dad got up to make me a tuna sandwich, he turns to me and he says, you know, but this is the life you always wanted. And uh, I went home and I thought about it. And you know, wrestling is everything that I love. You know, the, the pay-per-view main events, the being in front of the live crowd, the training to be a professional athlete, you know, and all the injuries, all the detached retinas, all the separated shoulders, all the muscle tears and everything. This is the life that I wanted my entire life. Morishima enters the ring as he does normally, lumbering forward, waiting for Dragon to emerge so that he can put him down for good. Maybe it's just me, but the trip back to Noah and the pressure of holding one of the most prestigious belts in the world seems to have weathered him a bit. He seems weary in a way he didn't before. Being at the top doesn't mean you've done it all, it just means there's a target on your back from now on. The lights go down and the final countdown plays, but something is off. The lights stay off as the intro plays, and fans begin to scream as they see something moving through the darkness, Morishima none the wiser. It's then that the lights come up, and the dragon has taken flight, jumping off the ropes with a flying knee that wrecks Morishima. Not letting up, he drop kicks the beast out of the ring, eventually nailing a reckless springboard splash that sends both competitors into the front rows of the crowd. His song still playing, as it reaches its crescendo to the chorus, Danielson proudly stands up and poses as the crowd screams out the lyrics. 
What we're watching here is no longer a performer, nor combatant. He's a king of his domain, a god with hundreds singing out in his temple. It's been a year since Morishima has interacted with Danielson, and maybe he's forgotten how heated things were. And just maybe, he forgot what Dragon has promised to do with him. Danielson, however, has forgotten nothing. Nor has he forgiven Morishima for depriving him of vision, titles, and most of all, honor. He isn't the same cerebral opponent he was in the beginning of our tale. He's become a one-man maelstrom of hurt and ill intent, optimized to finally complete the task at hand, slaying Morishima. The old cliche says to be careful when fighting monsters. You do not become one, but Dragon is like a year past that. He's a demon of the squared circle. Danielson hammers away with European uppercuts, forcing Morishima into the ringside table and grabbing the ring hammer, once again gouging his mortal enemy in the eye to repay him a dozen times over. He even tries to stab Morishima in the fucking throat with it, but Morishima stops him and takes the action back to the ring. Morishima no-sells an uppercut, so Dragon resorts to a series of headbutts to bash him down into the mat. Morishima rolls him up for a one count, and tries to hit a German off the apron before getting clubbed off. Dragon eventually gets sent to the barricade, and then it's some delicious blood that gets flowing for the remainder of the match. Morishima then goes on to commit a sickening series of attacks, with chair shots, a disgusting ring post spot, and finally, a rope assisted choke where he fish hooks Dragon because he's a dick. It's just after this that the most important set piece for the remainder of the match is introduced. The chain. Morishima performs a chain assisted choke and rains elbows down until the referee pleads for him to stop, which he finally does. Dragon finally forces his way back into the match by dodging a Morishima dropkick, trading strikes, and then murdering Morishima with a suicide dive that makes the crowd loudly proclaim what we already know. He is the best in the world, Crimea River Phil. Back into the ring, and Dragon hits about a billion kicks to Morishima, only getting in a two. In a move very similar to one performed by Yoshiaki Fujiwara versus Genichiro Tenryu, he wipes off his bloody face using his hands before slapping the shit out of Morishima with them. Unfortunately for him, Morishima breaks free and regains momentum, hitting a furious series of moves going from Yurinage to Lariat to finally a backdrop driver that is countered by Danielson. Danielson hits a strained, bridging German before transitioning into the cattle mutilation. Morishima is able to break it, but Dragon punishes him with elbows until the Japanese monster makes his way back up, no-selling the strikes and eventually choking him again with the chain. He attempts to hit a super backdrop driver, but Dragon counters it by dropping him testicles first onto the turnbuckle. And now, he has the chain. Curb stomps ensue combined with a chain assisted crossface. Barely hanging on, Morishima hulks up, landing an explosive powerbomb before almost putting away Danielson with a Northern Lights bomb combined with a driver before the battered goat gets his foot on the rope. Morishima finally wraps his arm with the chain, preparing the coup de grace to finally put him down and unleashes a god shattering lariat. Towards Danielson. But Dragon catches it, rolling into a Fujiwara armbar and then a fucking chain based cattle mutilation. Morishima tries to use his power one more time, but still bound up, is unable to avoid two giant low blows by the American Dragon. Chain elbows are hit, and once more, the cattle mutilation is locked in. Morishima has nothing left, and finally succumbs to the hold passing out. The locker room comes out to congratulate Dragon, who thanks the crowd with his out of character, assuming sincerity to send them home happy. This is not just a match, it's a blood spattered epic about two men who just need to kill each other. If you watch this match and dislike it, I no longer wish to speak to you. Easily the full five stars and one of the best matches of Dragon's career. C. 
seeing this Danielson is now the greatest of all time and lapping everybody as his career winds down, it's hardly surprising that this feud is as good as it is. But then once again, as John Boyce once said, these things are always inevitable after they happen. This series of matches shows off his incredible range, as the highly technical and strategic approach he takes early on gives way to senseless brutality as the feud goes on. Something also, of course, must be said for Morishima, who despite changing very little over the course of it, more than fulfills his end of the bargain, achieving his full potential as a force of nature. Furthermore, beyond the stellar ring work, something has to be said for the thematic beauty of this feud. As Dragon becomes more and more obsessed with beating Morishima, he gives up his humanity as well as his aspirations for the title. He slips back into what's comfortable, parts of the savagery from his previous heel persona, but now without any of the dickhead showboating. It's perhaps the most sincere, violent version of the man we've ever seen. And in the end, he gets the job done, but at an exorbitant cost. He's lived through a near retirement causing injury, three singles losses to Morishima, one DQ victory, and most importantly, a crisis of confidence. And all he has to show for it is a single victory over a man who's beaten him three times before. It's a story about obsession and what we sacrifice for our obsessions, and ultimately it lets you decide if it was worth it. ROH at the time was heaven for wrestling fans, and over the course of two years, these two found a way to drag each other to hell and back, completely eschewing any sense of sport or even humanity. This is not a story, it's a war, and ultimately an exercise in the horror of what these two men are willing to do to themselves and each other.